Welcome to the Atheist Experience. I'm your host, Russell Glasser, and with me today is my co-host, Jen Peoples. You again. Me again. Yeah. <laughs> Matt's out of town this week, so yeah, me again. Uh, today is Sunday, July 14th, 2013. We are a live call-in public access atheist television show based in Austin, Texas, dedicated to promoting positive atheism and the separation of church and state. We're available through uh, live streaming video at ustream.tv. The official website of the atheist community of Austin, is, or of the atheist experience, is atheist-experience.com. You can provide feedback by commenting on the official show blog at freethoughtblogs.com slash AXP. Uh, or you, you can also email us, us at tv at atheist-community.org. If you enjoy this show, you should also check out uh, Godless Bitches, which is an, a podcast that you can find on the Atheist Experience uh, website. And as always, the cast and crew of the show will be going to dinner afterwards uh, at Threadgill at 301 West Riverside Drive, arriving at around 6 p.m. And anyone who is an atheist or atheist friendly is welcome to join us. Uh, I have a quick announcement before we get to Jen, and it's actually the same announcement I made last week, but uh, next week, is the very amazing uh, and interesting Free Thought Blogs convention. It's going to be the hopefully first annual uh, free online convention featuring a whole lot of great speakers. Uh, Dave Silverman is going to be on. It's going to start Friday evening. Um, and uh, it's going to go for all three days of the weekend for various times. And you can log into Google Hangouts and check out panels. You'll be able to find the schedule at ftbcon.org. You can also follow at ftbcon at the, uh, uh, on Twitter. And uh, you can also find it on Facebook. So lots of ways to get in touch. Uh, I personally am now going to be involved in multiple panels. I'm, uh, I've organized a panel on evangelical atheism uh, featuring the very excellent radio host Jamila Bay and Vicki Garrison, who's been on Godless Bitches before, are both going to be joining me. Um, Jason, uh, uh, Jason Tibalt is going to be doing a panel on, two panels on video games, one of which I'm going to be in and one of which Linnea is going to be in. Uh, and there's going to be, uh, last I heard, there's going to be some stuff about uh, presuppositional apologetics, which I know everybody finds totally fascinating. So anyway, check out FTBCon at all sorts of venues. Next week. So, um where are you going to be September 28th? Good question. I don't know that I've thought that far ahead. Uh, well, I'm actually going to be on the ACA Bat Cruise. Oh, of course. Yeah. I'm, so, I'm almost certainly going to be there, too. And, you know, <laughs> uh, we're going to have a very special guest who's going to come down and do a lecture for us that weekend. We'll That's be making right. an announcement about that in the near future. We're not going to announce who it is right now? Um, I, I don't know that we... Uh, okay. Want to do that yet. We'll, we don't have a, we'll get we don't to have that. a topic for yeah. the lecture yet, but, but we're gonna. The have Bat an Cruise is so awesome every year, and this year it's gonna be extra awesome. Yeah, it may sell out this year, so you may want to go ahead and buy a ticket. Okay. But I can't tell you what to do. Thus, making um, that a self-fulfilling prophecy. Yeah, that's right. Um, but anyway, I do have a topic today to okay. talk about. Um, so you guys are probably familiar with the the polls that come out from time to time that talk about the rise of the non-religious in America? Okay. Uh, yes. Well, there's this guy named Rodney Stark. He's a professor up at, at Baylor. 
and he just published an article in the Wall Street Journal, um, I think about a week or so ago, that talked about, it, the title of it was The Myth of Non-Religious America. And in it, he, he kind of quotes some of the, the polls that have come out in recent years, like the 1990 poll that showed that 8% of Americans identified as having no religion, or they listed none as their religious affiliation. By 2007, that number was up to 15%, and in the 2012 poll, it was 20%. And he says, no, no, that doesn't mean all these people are non-religious. You know, hmm. There's all kinds of things. Some of these people pray. And he goes on to talk about um, saying that you have no religion is not the same as disbelieving in God. Right. We certainly and, wouldn't say all those people are atheists. Because I know that still less than 2% of people identify that way. Yeah, and he he um, he said that people that many people who say they have no religion are just saying that they don't have any official religious affiliation. Right, and we hear it, from those people. Yeah, they're like you know, I don't believe in any man-made religion, but I still love Jesus. Yeah, and he, you know he's saying that the increase in this no religion group uh, may be an illusion caused by the rising non-response rate to survey studies. <laughs> Okay. which is a nice way of defining his problem out of existence. But um, it, there's a, a recent uh, Pew Research poll that was published uh, January 2nd this year, and it's really um, worth taking a look at this because this one is about the, the percentage of people that think that the rise of the non-religious is a good thing, a bad thing, or doesn't make any difference. And so overall what it found is that um, among all adults, all religious affiliations, 11% of people think that the rise of the non-religious is a good thing. 39% say it doesn't make a difference, and 48% overall say it's a bad thing. And if you look at those numbers um, and split them up by age groups, uh, the 18 to 29 year old age group, the overwhelming majority of people think that it's either a good thing or it doesn't make a difference. Nice. So, yeah, very small number think it's a bad thing. And as I always say about gay marriage, the people who are against it the most are going to die. Yeah. <laughs> and that's, a, that's a abundantly clear from this poll if you look at the people that are, you know, most opposed or most think that it's, it's really bad that, you mm. know, we have a lot more non-religious people. Um, I think that 11% is very interesting because um, I... I don't think there's a lot of people who are actually um, believers in some kind of deity who actually think that it's a good thing to be non-religious. Mm -hmm. So I think that number is very telling. Um, and I would also point out th that... Um, yeah, I'm, I'm actually surprised that so few, it was like less than 50% of people think it's bad for there to be more non-religious right. people. That, that is right. unusual. Yeah. It seems um, to me. But uh, yeah, the, uh, one of the things I would caution people about uh, is with looking at that 20% of non-religious and say, oh, it, it overstates the number of atheists. Um, the rest of the people that identify with some kind of religious belief, that might be overstating the number of theists out there as well. Because, for example, you're Jewish, culturally, anyway. <laughs> right, yes, technically. So, I mean, how many Jews do you know that if asked, they would say, yeah, I'm Jewish? But in, really, in reality, they don't believe. Most of them who were raised Jewish, I mean, like, Jews have a very high rate of becoming atheist, right. and most of them would still say they're Jews. Right. And, you know, a lot of that is a cultural identification. Um, right. But the question for me is, how was it worded? Exactly. Because and and you, can, you can skew the results of your polls one way or another just by how you construct the poll. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I was having this discussion earlier today with um, Tracy and Schilling, actually, and we were talking about how would you word the question if you wanted to get more accurate answers about who really was a non-believer and who wasn't. And so we actually came up with some wording um, that would, um, it would still, you know, have some problems with bias and stuff like that, but you could actually do a better job of separating this out rather than just asking someone, do you have a religious affiliation? And they say no, and you assume they're an atheist or not. Uh, one thing you could do is ask people, um, word it such that the following statement best represents my beliefs and say, um, 
it's true that a God exists, or it's true that a God does not exist, or none of the above. And so if someone says it's true that a God exists and that best represents their beliefs, they're a theist. Anybody else is an atheist, whether they accept that label or not. Hmm. Yeah, of course, then you'd wind up with people being labeled atheists like, uh, for instance, Neil deGrasse Tyson very emphatically said, I don't want to be identified as an atheist. Right. Yeah, and, and that's the thing, that uh, wording the question that way allows people to avoid the use of the term atheist if they don't want to. This is just a statement of what you believe. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, the, the label that we use for people who don't believe a God exists is atheist. But right. you don't have to apply that to yourself if you I'm, want to. I'm reminded of a survey that I um, kind of frequently bring up to people who, who uh, want to be snotty about philosophy when they're, when they're trying to argue for religion, which is a, a survey that was done among like professional philosophers, mm -hmm. which basically gave them a whole lot of questions and uh, worded them in, and w instead of asking simple yes or no type things, um, they would ask, uh, do you accept, lean toward, uh, or, ex or accept or lean toward the opposite or, not, or neither? Um, and so the, the questions are things like free will, compatibilism, libertarianism, or no free will? And then for God, theism or atheism mm -hmm. well in this case they actually asked that specifically but um, you know I, I just like to tout the fact that 72 percent of professional philosophers said they accept or lean toward atheism and only 14 percent accepted or lean toward theism yeah. but anyway um, but you can have a complex survey where you have yeah. where you take multiple answers per question and you ask a bunch of different questions to clarify. Yeah, and that's that, you know that's one of the issues with these polls is a lot of them are done um, as telephone polls, mm -hmm. and telephone polls really don't lend themselves to really complex questions because you've got probably uh, someone doing the poll who may not be very well versed in in all of the nuances of what of the questions that they're asking. And so if someone asks that, that person doing the phone survey a, a question to clarify something, that person may not even know the answer who's doing the poll. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there are all kinds of problems here. But, you know, the data, it still supports the idea that we're moving toward a more non-religious and more secular um, view, especially among younger people. Right. So the... Uh, probably once a year we get a, a, an article or, or something uh, of some theist who's complaining that we're overstating our numbers. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, yeah, I try not to overstate our numbers. Yeah. I mean, I feel like atheism is still very much a minority position. It is. Uh, and, but I do think that it is growing faster than theism. I think uh, theism has very yes. much achieved market saturation. There is nobody who uh, isn't a theist already who hasn't heard about the product, at least. Yes. All right. So it looks like we've got some full lines here. So do we want to go ahead and go to calls? Uh, yes. John in Radford, Virginia. Uh, yes, sir. How are you guys doing tonight? I'm good. All right. How's the weather there in Austin? Kind of hot. <laughs> mm hmm Well, enough How's of the small in talk. <laughs> I have an interesting uh, argument proving that God's existence. Okay. Uh, using the double slit experiment, which just briefly shows that when a particles exhibit uh, wave duality, particle and wave duality, um, and when the uh, electrons were shot at the slit, not observed. They went into being a wave, went through both slits at one time, and hit the back wall at a pattern which shows that they were in a wave-like function. Now, when scientists observed, hey, which one is this going through? You know, is it going through both at the same time? They put a detector by one of the slits to see which one the particle was going through. When they did, the particle went back into being a particle and not a wave. 
only went through one slit or the other. That and is a fairly is, accurate description of the uh, two-slit experiment. Thanks. You're welcome. I try to be as, as uh, quick as possible in it. Okay. Now, um, so isn't that logically, in a logic argument, proof that the particle is exhibiting a sort of consciousness? No. No. And, and, and I think if you review the primary literature, like in peer-reviewed journals, you will not find anyone who says in any serious way that uh, what you said. Okay, I'll have to go back and look it up. Yeah, I mean, yeah. seriously, find a reputable peer-reviewed journal that claims that and not just, you know, wild speculation. But isn't that a logical assumption? No, it isn't. Let me ask you something. Why do you think um, physicists don't find this compelling evidence of a god? Uh, I think Niels Bohr even talked about how we're all observing what God's consciousness unfold before us. I'll have to look the quote up. I guess I'm rather unprepared. No, you really, no. Here's another thing, too. If we are, particles are waves and we're all made out of particles, mm -hmm. then, you know, what's, who, who says where the apple is and how it looks like for us to see and observe? What? Because they're, you know, physicists. So, so let's, let's go back to this again. You realize that most physicists are not theists, right? Yes, I do realize that. Okay, so why do you think that is? Why do you think they are not persuaded by this double slit experiment that a god exists? Well, I mean, it's only, uh, it's not absolute proof that God exists. Well, but no, physicists don't require absolute proof. They're scientists. They understand that doesn't exist. Why do you think they don't find this compelling evidence of a god? Probably because they're just not trying to, to look at it as evidence. Why would they? Why, why would they not go where the evidence leads? And if the evidence led them to believe that a God exists, why would they not accept that? Right. Well, shouldn't I mean, shouldn't this that, stuff I actually be published? I mean... I mean I, I, well, you, let me ask you a question. <laughs> if a particle behaves differently when it's being watched, uh -huh. what would you call that? The, the intervention of it changing from a wave back to a particle. I would call it a limitation in our ability to measure something. Or, well, or two, or I wouldn't. Two simultaneous I, I don't states. think that that would be. I mean, it's not exactly a limitation on our ability to measure it. I mean, the Heisenberg's uncertainty principle says that it is actually fundamentally uncertain, and not just that our measurement well, instruments aren't good enough, yeah. but that it's fundamentally unknowable. Um, but I don't think it's accurate to describe it as behaving differently when it's observed. I think, I think um, I'm not totally clear on this, but oh, when, you ob when you observe something, the function collapses with respect to that frame of observation, basically. Exactly. So it's, so it's not so much, I mean, relativity, for instance, indicates that there is no ultimately correct objective frame of reference for anything in the universe. And so it would be wrong to suggest that there's got to be some God frame of reference where everything is actually true. What relativity says and what this uncertainty in quantum yeah. mechanics also says um, is that uh, what's actually happening depends on where you're looking from. And it, de and it doesn't say that there's an actual final correct frame. Okay, Mark, well, give me a nod or something if I'm not being crazy. If it depends on where you're looking from. Shrug. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Uh, like, sorry, I thought I was, didn't mean to interrupt you. Oh. you, know, you yeah, are yeah, on ahead. one side of the room looking at a chair, and I'm on the other side of the room looking at the chair. Right. But the chair is there in that one spot. Right. But we are two different observers looking at them in different locations. Yeah, well, at the macro level, all the different possibilities sort of average out to, uh, so, that the physical, so that the physical properties of large objects have some kind of um, 
some kind of sensible explanation uh, that that basically isn't so much dependent on what happens at the much smaller level. Although, if that chair was moving at near light speeds, then you'd still have the problem of frames of reference again. Yes, but, but it's. Uh, I wanted to say that it's not just electrons that have gone through the two slits and have changed their function. It's also atoms and even a buckyball molecule. Right. The physical objective universe has some existence outside of people's minds. Uh, mm -hmm. It's just that at the quantum level, how that universe behaves is very fuzzy. I just, thought, I just think it's a good, a good argument. You know, what, what, what would you call it? When I said behaves differently, would you call it acts differently? Would you call it... No, I would say we no. view it differently. We yeah. view it differently. But there's only one... I mean, it either goes through one slit or the other. Where no, before, that's actually both. not... See, the thing about quantum mechanics is that it doesn't objectively go through one slit or the other. That's kind of the point. It, yeah, mathematically it goes through both. It goes through one, it goes through just the other, and it goes through none. So you are right on that. Okay. But, uh, but, but how would you get from there to a god? Yeah, yeah I because, still... Because they're, the particles change their behavior when they know that they're being observed. Okay, what does they that don't have know, to do with the They don't god? know they're being observed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they don't know they're being observed, right. How do they not know they're being observed when we shoot them through the slit when we're they not don't watching have them? Mind. They, they, like they, yeah, they don't. when we watch them... No, they, they don't have they, a mind. They're particles. Yes, but uh, who's, who's changing or what is changing their, their uh, behavior? It's, it's some of the weirdness that happens at, at the quantum level. Right. I mean, you're not asking that kind of question about gravity, right? I mean, when, when you drop a rock, you're not saying like, who's making that rock move downward, are you? No, not one bit. Okay, well, that I mean, that's the same, I mean, that's the same thing with quantum mechanics. Things happen the way they happen according to physical laws. Yeah, pretty much. So, no, I don't see it as a compelling argument for God, is the bottom line. Or for particles having minds somehow. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you for your time. Right. Okay. Thank you. Well, thanks for calling. All right. Donovan in North Carolina. Donovan? Hello? Charlotte, North Carolina. Somebody's on the line. I hear him. If you're on the line, hurry up and say, yes, it might be me, or I'm hanging up. Okay. All right. So. Phil in Pennsylvania. Hey, guys. Is, is this Hi. Jen Russell today? Yes. It is. Hey, it's great to talk to you. I really enjoy your show a lot. Um, as, as far as being an atheist goes, I'm kind of sitting on the fence, but um, uh, I, I, I've definitely learned a lot from your program on how to argue different issues, including uh, religious topics. Um, mm -hmm. I'm trying to make this as brief as possible. Um, what I want to know is, is it possible to be an atheist and yet still cling on to a belief that there is uh, a possibility of an afterlife? And the reason it's, I'm asking uh, is... I mean, it's possible, but why would you unless there's evidence of an afterlife? Okay, let, let, yeah, let me explain on that. Um, I have a landlord that um, her father passed away recently. And they went to a psychic because they were going through a really hard time oh, no. with... Uh, <laughs> the grief okay. mechanism and so, so forth. And they did uh, a number of different things. They have the latest technology and um, EVP work, which is electronic voice phenomenon and so forth. And I, I'll be honest with you, I, I, I look at everything through the lens of skepticism, okay? And I didn't believe this stuff. I didn't want to believe this stuff. But there's been so much stuff that I have seen and observed in my own personal life that it really tends to make me think about it because I've, I've, I've just had too many account reports come to it. Such and, as? Uh, for example, in her case, you know, she was revealed information that there was no possible way any psychic would have known 
And Such I've as? heard of different medical doctors in emergency rooms where they brought people back to life during near-death experiences, as you would call yeah, them. None of them. Okay, a there child haven't or an been. Adult would come no, back hang with on, information hang on, with hang no on, life. hang on. There yeah. haven't been any credible documented uh, studies that say that people can come back to life after being dead. If it had, it, it would be world news and maybe they could win the James Randi million dollar prize. Yeah, so, I mean, whatever you, whatever you think you've read about people coming back from the dead, I think you should take a look at what sources are telling you that. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing I want to touch well, on is... Well, wait a minute. Is, no, no, no. You, 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 let me go back a minute. We were talking about things that psychics knew that they couldn't possibly know. You didn't give an example of that. Well, names and circumstances and, and, and things can, that there was... Can you give, like, a specific example of something that happened? Yeah, actually, uh, the landlord that I was speaking about, she had, like, this little mustache... Uh, key ring thing that was lost, and they had one of these things called a Frank's box, and uh, she was looking for it for some time, and it came through It came through that um, you found it, I got it, you were looking for it, and that to me, I, I don't know how to explain so, it. So somebody Anyways. was missing their keys, and then they found their keys, and that's proof right. that there's life after death. Well, I... See, I don't know. That's why I'm asking. Um, you know, I, I, I agree um, with you on so many different areas, and it just there's, there's so many different reports now of folks that will have had these experiences. And I know that when a person goes through the death process, um, I know scientifically that there is different levels of hormones released in the brain, serotonin and all these things that can create that experience. It doesn't prove that there's a God. It doesn't prove that there's a soul. Uh, but... It just there's been so many though that I've read before that were endorsed by emergency room physicians and so forth that I just wanted to basically my question comes down to this. Is it possible for one to have an absence of a belief in God and yet still believe in a possibility of an afterlife or is those two ideas not compatible? Yeah, it's possible. I mean, to, to be an atheist you just have to um, reject the claim that a God exists. Correct. Okay. Um, what I would say that is that if you hold the beliefs that you hold, mm -hmm. you cannot claim to also be a skeptic. Right. Well, I didn't, I didn't really wish to be brought into all this, but it, it, there was just been so many things that came to me. Like, I originally grew up in Gettysburg, and that they say I've heard different things that that's supposed to be the number one Right. Well, yeah, I mean, well, you're well. saying that skepticism is important to you, but so far the things that you've chosen as what you want to tell us about uh, to convince us there might be an afterlife have been pretty weak. No, uh, I no agree. And, and, you know, outside of personal experience, you're absolutely right. I mean, and, and until a person experiences those things on their own, and that, of course, is not an indicator of evidence, that's where you guys have taught me a yeah, lot. Yeah, but even so if, really but what, what, it, what kind of personal experience are you talking about? Well, as for me, I actually worked as a correctional officer for about five, close to six years in a prison. I worked as a CO, also called a prison guard. Okay. And uh, I resigned from that about five years back. But we had an incident one night uh, where there was another correctional officer on staff. He was nobody that was afraid of anything. He was a former military officer. And uh, he witnessed a, uh, what appeared to him as an inmate that was out walking about during lock-in hours after midnight. And uh, he called for backup, as was for protocol. And uh, the description that he gave of this inmate uh, was somebody that had committed suicide. And they had a different color uniform on and the way that he had described him. And we can't play games with each other in jail because they... When you sign out keys, for example, they have your identification number in the control room. And there's just no possible way that some of the events happened there. I mean, we had... So, so let me, let me ask you this. Well, no, let Jen ask you this. Well, uh, no, <laughs> sure. So, so did you see this thing that he claimed to see? Well, I didn't see that specifically. Did, you get a, did, you get a, did he get a picture of it, maybe? 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 
quite honest, okay. explain so, when I worked in that profession. Okay, okay. That, but were there but, were there okay. video logs or motion sensors or anything that they, indicated yeah, that yeah, this yeah, was yeah, right? Yeah, of course. I mean, it was a high security facility. They had, so there yeah. was so you have some video guy of this guy. Uh, not that particular incident, no. Okay, so so, no. so basically, <laughs> what you've done is you've recounted a story from your landlord, and you've recounted mm -hmm. a story from a colleague at work. Right. And you're claiming these are your personal experiences? Well, I've had some of my own there as well, like different well, doors. No, 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 well, 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 then why would you start with somebody else's experiences? Well, it kind of just ties in. I'm just, honestly, Jen, I, I'm just trying to make sense of it all because okay. um, I grew up in this. I, I, you know, I am skeptical. No, you're not. Time, Very. You're not actually skeptical. I'm just trying to make sense of it. I mean, really, I understand. to be truthful with you, I, 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 I didn't want to believe in this stuff. I thought it was all a bunch of, you know, crap, so to speak. So why but did you? Because from everything you've told me, we don't have it really changed our minds so far. Yeah. Right. I, I understand. Um, I don't know. I just, I just wanted to see what your possible um, answer might be to that. I mean, as far as an explanation, I mean, there uh, you, you see about it all the time in, in Gettysburg. They have these tours and stuff all the time, and that's where I was growing and raised. So this and is I'm more people yeah. telling stories to tourists. Yeah. Yeah. What could possibly be their motive you, if you it wasn't true? <laughs> you yeah, said that right. you had had some personal experiences that convinced you. Would you care to give us your best one? Yeah, actually, at my grandparents' house, uh -huh. uh, when I was a teenager growing up, I'm going to be 31 at the end of this month. Um, back when I was around 12 or 13, I had a number of things happen. And I had a uh, distant family member from Virginia, which is too far from Pennsylvania. They came up to watch her, my grandmother after she got out of the hospital. And I told her about this particular room where I always felt awkward in it, like there was somebody watching me. You know how you get that feeling? And, yes, I uh, do get that so feeling, and there aren't any ghosts watching me when I get it. And, 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 and the thing is, it was on a day like today, I don't know what it's like in Austin, Texas right now, but, you know, it was a beautiful day, sunshine, no Hollywood special effects, nothing. And I said, if there's anybody in here, can you please give us, you know, a sign that you're here? And all sorts of things moved throughout the room, and to this day... I still have no explanation for it, and I've had that happen on more than one occasion. What, at, what at all house. sorts now, of things? What moved and in exactly what way? Uh, there was a filing court, uh, filing uh, cabinet that came open. Uh, uh -huh. The filing drawer is like about, I would say, about four and a half feet tall. Your old traditional metal type that you pull open it has a little slide lock you have to push to the right and pull it open. And there was a, a very loud noise like underneath of our feet and so you were so you like sat that, there I looking was, directly at this filing cabinet and it opened by itself well the only thing that strikes me as weird is it happened within moments of me asking if there is anybody here to uh, so to you were it. looking at it and watched it open yes i find that hard to believe yeah i, I mean at best you've had something that you can't explain but how do you get from that to there's you know an afterlife or ghosts exist or something like that I mean, well i'm not really sure jen i mean it's like it's kind of like this I, one of the main reasons i guess i'm still on the fence it's like if you really have a, a like a partner in your life or a child or somebody and you tell them for example that you love them with your whole heart Obviously, we don't mean our physical heart to bleed, you know, that beats blood throughout our body. We mean, we mean that on a deeper level. And that, to me, kind of thinks that there, that there is something more than just flesh and blood when it comes to human beings. I That's don't really know. That's why I've been simply calling for feedback. I really like you guys a lot, and I just simply wanted to see what you had to say okay. about that. And, what, um, I, what I think is that if you want these kinds of stories to be credible, you should try to, let's say, get a recording of them uh, or uh, some kind of concrete evidence, something testable that can be demonstrated to other people. Because like yeah. I said at the beginning, you know, you, you've um, believed in a lot of these stories about people coming back from the dead, but when they try to test this stuff, 
Um, oh, you know, there was an awesome uh, cartoon, uh, XKCD, just, a, ju just this past week where uh, he showed a graph of the number of people who are carrying who are carrying cameras on their person at all times, every waking minute of the day, and that oh, wow. that graph. Well, <laughs> not oh well. I mean, I've got one. It's my cell phone. I carry it all the time, uh, and and then he says, in just the last few years, without much fanfare, we've conclusively disproved the existence of ghosts, UFOs, and Bigfoot. Because surely, with millions and millions of people carrying these cameras all the time, somebody would have caught this stuff in some way that could be demonstrated. You know what I yeah. mean? Whereas, whereas we're just left hearing you, I, I mean, I, I'm not calling you a liar or anything. No, I, I actually mistakes. think, yeah, I, I think you believe everything you've told us. I don't think yeah, you're lying. absolutely. But I think you're wrong. Uh, you know, and, and that, you know, I'm fully open. That's the thing. You know, you got to really keep an open mind towards things, and that's why I'm simply calling you. I mean, um, there's a big misconception. I'm, I'm very into political science, and I know one of the things I run into very much, which leads on to the second thing, if you have time for it. Um, you know, um, many of our founding fathers, you know, they they always say that this is a Christian nation. Most of them were actually theists. Yeah. Which simply means yeah. that they, they believe in a higher power, but they didn't subscribe to any creed or doctrine of any particular type. And you guys have certainly done a, a, a fantastic job of, you know, taking my, uh, you know, belief in the Bible, you know, for example. And, and it's like Matt, you know, when he talked about his experience and reading from the scripture that we are to show reason why we believe in what we do and he couldn't do it i had come to that same conclusion myself i was you know in in ministry and things that you know very similar and you know that's why i listen to you guys every week and your arguments are wonderful it helps me in so many areas of life mm -hmm. well, not just yeah. religion well i'm glad yeah, we could help know, well uh, phil we, we've actually got full lines right yeah. now so we need to wrap this up sure i'm, I'm sorry um, thank you very much, and uh, I hope to talk to you guys again sometime in the future. All okay, right. thanks. thanks for calling. Yeah, have a great night. Thanks. Okay. Bye. You too. Josh in San Diego. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hi. Uh, first of all, let me just say uh, you, know, you guys are doing a great show. But uh, thank you. <clears throat> I'm a little nervous. Uh, I actually have two questions for you guys. The first one is actually more a matter of advice. Uh, my mother, since, since I've come out as an atheist, my mother continues to still tell people that I believe in God, and I, I, I really find it insulting, and I'm not exactly sure how, how to deal with this. Why don't you go around telling people she doesn't believe in God? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that was actually uh, one, of, one, of my, uh, one of the ideas that I, that I had. Yeah, and yeah, let her see how that feels. Yeah, well, based on her uh, her logic, I I must believe in God because someone raised the way I am couldn't not believe in God. You know, um, denial is a wonderful thing sometimes yes. for people. I, I, uh, yeah. You can't make people stop being jerks. You can just limit your contact yeah. with them. And you, I mean, you know, you can tell them that you don't like it and you don't, and you find it insulting and you wish they would stop, but you can't actually make them stop. Right, yeah. right. So, uh, yeah. Uh, I was going to move on to my, my, my second point real quick, because that okay. first one was just kind of a quick thing. Sure. Okay. Uh, my second point is uh, now I'm in the military, and as an atheist, uh, I'm forced to sit through many military ceremonies that are start off being led with a public prayer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What is uh, your guys' uh, take on that? Jen's I mean, in the military. Like, I'm going to let her take this one. Or was. Yeah, I, was yeah, I retired after 26 years in the Army. So, um, yeah, I feel your pain. Um, basically, these uh, ceremonial prayers, they were not a traditional part of the ceremonies. If you look at um, uh, what branch of the military are you in? Uh, Navy. Okay. So, well, the Navy may have some different traditions. I know in the Army, um, 
All of our, our drilling ceremonies is covered by a field manual called FM 22-5. If you look at, at FM 22-5, it doesn't have any place in there for prayers as part of ceremonies. It was not a traditional part of, of the military ceremony. Um, what happened was, you know, about 30 years ago, um, 25, 30 years ago, the evangelicals began to infest the military and they started inserting prayers whenever they could. And this is actually um, covered under this idea of ceremonial deism. So the idea is that um, it's just a ceremonial thing. It's not actually a prayer, which is, of course, nonsense. It actually is a prayer. Right. Um, and therefore, you should have to put up with it. Um, I don't think that's right. I think that we should go back to the traditional way these ceremonies were conducted and to omit the prayers. And if you want to pray before a ceremony, you can pray before the ceremony. You can get together with like-minded people and pray after the ceremony. But during the ceremony, when you're required to stand there in formation, uh, you should not be subjected to a religious activity that you don't necessarily agree with. Right, and with no choice to even opt out of it. Right. Um, and so that, that's the issue. You've got military people being forced to participate in a religious event when that's not what you signed up for. That's not why you're there. Right. And you don't have a choice. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't know what to tell you other than um, you can contact the Military Religious Freedom Foundation and uh, uh, see if they can help you out. Also, the Military Association of Atheists and Free Thinkers, yes. which is at militaryatheists.org. Yeah. Okay, okay. So, and I actually just wanted your guys' opinion on that because I feel like that's one area that the the wall of church and state is continuously violated and doesn't get addressed. Yeah, and see, it's, to me, it's, uh, it, it's a similar situation as um, being in a, uh, a public school. I mean, the, the rules are pretty strict about public schools. It basically says that, you know, a teacher can't walk in and, and lead a class in prayer. You know, right. because, and the reason for that is because that's an unusually coercive environment. You have a teacher who has uh, pretty broad authority over children in a classroom. And you have the same situation going on in the military, where you have um, senior officers and NCOs who have very broad authority over a large group of people, and they're going in and, and forcing them to participate in a religious activity. So I think, you know, it, that is the very definition of an unusually coercive environment. Right. So, and, and, and I don't think the option to opt out of the ceremony would be the right option either because no. it's still going on and being publicly endorsed. Right. The, the ceremony itself, the ceremony itself is a legitimate military activity. It's the, adi the addition of the prayers that right. are, are not legitimate military activities. Right. And uh, many of the, the, the Christians I know, they won't come out and say it, but their position is essentially, I'm against government endorsement of religion unless it's my religion. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly it. Uh, right. Um, I, I had, I mean, this reminds me when you're talking about unusually coercive situations. I had, uh, I used to take Taekwondo classes a few years ago, and there was this situation where uh, the instructor on the belt testing day when all the students had to be there brought in a guy who was pitching a multi-level marketing scheme. <laughs> uh, and I, I mean, in that situation, it was a private organization and I was voluntarily associated with it and that was eventually a factor in my deciding to quit. But in right. your situation, it's different because you're in the military and, uh, you know, just walking out is uh, complicated. Yeah, it's, <laughs> and, it's basically not an option depending where you are. Right. And they're the ones who are out of place. So just like when uh, people push school prayer on kids, which we also don't approve of, this is a situation where you ought to figure out what your leverage is to push back against these people interfering with uh, public institutions that they have no business in. Right. Okay, well, it is uh, real good to call in for the first time. I've been watching for quite a while. Uh, All I'll, right. I'll go ahead and get off the line now, though. Okay, right. thanks for calling, thanks, and Josh. Uh, best of luck to you. All right, thank you. You guys have a great one. You too. All right, bye. Nadu in London. Am I pronouncing Nadu right? Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, oh, okay. It's, 
Can, can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Yes. Cool, great. Uh, first time calling. Uh, I've heard the show a lot of times. Uh, I think it's, it's great. So uh, actually I had a kind of a question for discussion really, um, which, which came about because I was listening to this uh, podcast called The Naked Scientist. Mm -hmm. uh, which is a BBC radio podcast. Uh, and in it, um, one of the hosts was describing um, a, uh, a, an incident where he had a placebo effect. So he actually injected uh, a saline solution into a patient uh, and told him that it was a painkiller. And the patient exhibited uh, basically all uh, symptoms of uh, having received the actual painkiller. Yeah. So that when, yeah. So uh, uh, I, I got to thinking whether the analogy could be extended to religion to some extent. Now this was a case of somebody who actually had a reasonable basis to believe something, and uh, just having that belief alone led his brain to do some uh, actual uh, physiological stuff within his body. Okay. Now, I'm not too sure whether you would agree with me that uh, they, I, I, I actually don't think most people who say they, they do believe in God or they believe in religion, I don't think any of them actually really honestly do have that kind of belief. Well, um, I mean, just like the guy before you who was saying... Oh, let me kind of put it in. Yeah. We, we, could, we, could, we could definitely say that none of them have a reasonable basis to believe something. Okay, uh, well, I agree with that. So what I wanted to, yeah, so, so what I wanted to ask is if uh, you had any examples of any practice, religion of faith system where people had a reasonable basis to believe something, though it was false, maybe an elaborate kind of a setup where I, I don't know what uh, no. kind of reasonable basis can lead you to a false belief, really. I, I yeah. mean, you know, if you are led to believe something that is false, then there must be a, a fault in your reasoning somewhere. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, uh, let's say you have an isolated kind of a society where people are kind of uh, fooled into believing some kind of a God system. Well, okay, uh, like, yeah, g given I mean, the limited information people have, yeah. they could yeah, yeah. believe something incorrect without having further information to disprove it. Uh, do you think in, in that situation you'd see something like a placebo effect, something more tangible? Uh, I'm pretty sure that there are actual studies that yeah. show that people who believe, for instance, that everything happens for a reason, just for example, uh, recover faster. Uh, so yeah, there, there are uh, placebo effects that are associated well, with religious beliefs. Well, and, and also I would say that um, there are some activities associated with religion, um, prayer for example, that may give people a greater sense of control over a situation because if you have a belief that you're invoking some deity that has the power to make you feel better or something like that then then you may actually feel better if you pray and but, but, uh, but it's, it's, uh, somehow the, the various prayer studies in, in, in the realm of actually kind of people who are sick etc they don't they, they always seem to fail so if there's a real placebo effect, shouldn't be kind of sweet there? I'm sorry, I did, that what? was kind of garbled. I didn't really hear what you said. Uh, 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 I, I know that people have done studies where prayer has been seen to, um, that they've investigated whether prayer actually helps in terms well, of... Well, actually the prayer uh, doesn't help. Yeah, I mean, at, at best, any effect that prayer might have uh, comes from... Uh, can come from people believing that they're going to get better, but I think yeah. in some of the studies, at least, the people who knew they were who knew they were being prayed for actually yeah. got worse. Yeah. So I mean, it, it kind of depends on the situation. Yeah, but but the the thing I was specifically talking about is um, there's actually a a, a non-religious example that you can use to 
demonstrate that if people feel like they have more control over a situation, um, particularly when it comes to pain, they may experience less pain. And the example is, um, you've seen the little um, uh, demand pumps that people who are um, being given pain medication sometimes have, where you push a button and you get some, a, a small dose of pain medication. Um, what they find is that people actually use less pain medication when they, they control it like that because they know they can control it. So they actually use less than if you had to call a nurse who came in and you know, gave them a pain shot because they know they can, they can instantly control the amount of pain medication they get. So they, they actually use less pain medication, okay? Um, and, you know, it, and it may be that they actually feel less pain because their anxiety level is lower. They know they have control over this. And so that's what I'm saying is that there may be some activities associated with religion that act in the same way, that give people a greater sense of control over something because they feel like they are directly invoking their deity who will help them, you know. And in fact, you know, no help is forthcoming, but if they feel better, well, you know, that's basically what a placebo does, right? Cool, yeah, I, uh, th uh, that didn't answer my question. It, 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 it's just that when I uh, was thinking about this, uh, uh, though I'm not a piece of any sort, uh, I, I kind of came to have an opinion that uh, Maybe there is something in, in 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 terms of having belief, as in real belief, uh, that that could uh, really uh, impact people in a, in a in a tangible, not just in a kind of a make them feel better, but uh, in an actual uh, some physical changes in the body or uh, or something like that. Right. Well. Yeah. Um the placebo effect is definitely real and it's well documented and so I want to make sure everybody's clear about that. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, the, the main issue of the placebo is that w through whatever means, whether you believe, whether it's because you believe you're getting super strong medicine or you believe a magic man is, uh, is taking your pain away, um, you know, it, it's the sincere belief that things are going to get better for you that improves things. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, uh, 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 yeah, uh, uh, thanks for your time and uh, great show. All right, thank you. Okay, thanks for calling. Looks like we got about five minutes left to take Will in Denver. Hi, guys, how's it going? Good, how are you? Great. I'm good. Um, so I am an atheist, and sometimes I do debate with theists on many subjects. And a lot of times it comes to why they believe in God. They bring up the first cause, the Big Bang, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think it's great they don't deny the Big Bang, and they, they are not denying science. But then, you know, I ask a follow-up question, well, then, who created God? And they say, well, God has always existed. Right. And, you yeah. know, I try to bring up the point that that's actually special people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it's just how they get around, uh, you know, the uh, Kulan cosmological argument. But I was wondering what you guys think is the best way to deal with that kind of objection. Well, I, I think just what you're doing is pointing out that that's a logical fallacy called special pleading. And that, yeah. that asserting that God has some special quality and has always existed does not demonstrate the existence of anything. It just demonstrates that they don't understand how logic works. Yeah, I, I mean, um, you should listen to last week's show. Tracy and I took a caller for a really long time where exactly this argument happened. Uh, but you should also keep in mind that when you're arguing with somebody who's a sincere believer, you don't have to change their mind, and you probably won't. So... Um, you know, so the process of arguing with them can be educational, and obviously I totally support that. Yeah. Uh, but if you just get it to a point where they're just saying things and then, you know, resorting to because I said so, and you just say, I don't agree, that's an impasse, and that's as good as it's going to get in that conversation. Unless yeah. they can yeah. provide credible evidence for you, then they're not winning. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. 
Yeah, at that point, they're pretty much making an appeal to faith. And, right. you know, faith doesn't tell me what's actually true. And at that point, I would, yeah, I would shift that argument to how useful faith is, because you could say, well, I don't have that faith, so I guess it's not true for me. <laughs> well, sure. Um, yeah, I did watch last week's show. You know, I've been watching a lot of episodes. I think you guys are really awesome. I think you guys are doing a great job. Thanks. Well, thank you. And, um... Well, I guess that's all I really had for you. Quick call, but... Um, well, I, uh, I know arguing with believers can be frustrating, and uh, I, th I think what you really need to do is shift your expectations a little and see what you're going to get out of it. Because if you think that you're going to change people's minds, you can shift them a little bit, but you're not going to like totally flip them on the question of God when they've believing it, been believing it all their lives. Yeah, that's probably true. I just, um, I like pointing out, you know, some logical inconsistencies with their arguments and making, maybe making them think critically a little bit about their beliefs. Right. Well, you know, and one, one, of, right. the, one of the fun things about talking with theists sometimes, you don't even have to argue with them. <laughs> it, all you have to do is engage them in a conversation about, you know, what their beliefs are and why they believe it. And if you want to play a little game to kind of sharpen yourself, you can, you can, like take mental notes of what they're claiming and then go back and, and plug in all of the logical fallacies they've committed throughout their yeah, kind of a go fun and game. do some research. Yeah. So Right. Yeah. You don't even have to debate them, just let them talk. It's entertaining sometimes. All right, well I guess that's pretty good advice. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right, well um Thanks well, did for you calling. Have something to say? What? Did you have something to say? No, uh, thanks for calling and uh, talk to you again sometime. Yeah, I'll let you guys try to get to one more before you quit. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. So I got thanks. one guy on the line who could lead to a very long conversation, but we don't have that. We have a minute and a half. So instead of that, I'm going to hold that guy till after and instead take Jack in London. Second London caller today. Yeah. Hello? Jack? Hello? 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 Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Oh, fantastic. Okay, so to summarize my question, um, I'm wondering if it's possible for an atheist and a Christian to be in a relationship, a healthy one, one that works, if the Christian believes in a literal, fiery pitchforks and devil's hell. Um, for uh, me, no. I would find it very difficult, but that doesn't mean nobody could. Yeah. I, I, could, not, I could not be in a relationship with someone who thought I was going to hell. See, because I'm in a relationship with a Christian and have been for a very long time. Oh, man, and that's rough. we uh, usually are open about beliefs, but when it comes to hell... She Jack, can you, hold on, can you hold on for a minute? We're going to end the show, but uh, stay on okay, hold for sorry. a minute, and, and I'll pick you up afterwards. But uh, good luck to you. That's our show. Thanks, crew. Thanks, Jen. See you at Thread Gills. All right. Great show. Thanks. Thanks. You too. <laughs> Bye. Bye.